Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to TechSRX Community of Practice Echo. Please note that we are recording these sessions for later distribution. Anything listed in the chat does not appear in the recording. Your name may appear, so please note you can change your name to first name only. My name is Shreya Prasanna, and I will be facilitating today's session. A few quick announcements before we begin. To help us with attendance, please enter your name, email, and affiliation into the chat, which can be accessed by clicking on the speech bubble on the navigation bar at the bottom of your window. If you're one of our BWL Texas providers, please make sure that you identify yourselves during this session. If you're joining by phone, please email your phone number and name to bwltx at yudhiska.edu. Some housekeeping, please stay muted unless you're speaking. If you've joined the computer, your mute button is on the bottom left of your Zoom controls. If you're on the phone, just press star six to unmute. We encourage everyone to speak at these sessions, especially during the discussion portion. We want to hear from as many of you as possible. So please keep your comments brief to allow time for others to speak up. Or if you'd prefer, you can use the chat feature to share comments and questions. Please note that no protected health information is allowed in either the chat or our discussions. If you would like to view closed captioning for this session, please navigate to the bottom of your Zoom window and select the Show Captions option. You may need to click on More at the bottom right of your Zoom screen to find this menu. Towards the end of the session, the BWELL Texas team will send out a link to an evaluation survey. All participants filling out the survey will be automatically entered into a raffle for a $30 Walmart gift card. Our didactic today is on practical harm reduction strategies for SUDs and will be presented by Dr. Snehal Patel. Following that, we will discuss a case presented by Dr. Siddharth Waklu. We'll start with introductions followed by didactics, BVL program announcements, case presentation and discussion. Thank you all again for joining today's ECHO. We look forward to learning alongside with you and encourage you to share your questions, insights, and experiences in today's conversation. With that, we will move on to some introductions. Um, Dr. Waklu. Thank you, Shred. Uh, Siddharth Waklu, I'm a uh, professor of psychiatry at UT Southwestern. Uh, I'm the uh, uh, the director of the Clinical Addiction Psychiatry Service and the, uh, the Addiction Psychiatry Fellowship Director. And um, I'm glad to be here. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Patel. Hi, everyone. My name is Nehal Patel. I'm an assistant professor at uh, Dell Medical School. Um, and uh, uh, great to see you, Dr. Waklu. I haven't, uh, you were actually one of my attendings in medical school several years ago. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Patel. Andrea. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrea Hebler, and I am the program coordinator for all the ECHO series. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. Is Dr. Kowalczyk here? Has she joined us yet? Not yet. She will be joining us later. Okay. Now, with that, we will, I guess, move on to our didactics. Uh, Dr. Patel, uh, whenever you're ready, you can take it away. Is it full screen for you all? Yes, it's perfect. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. All right, thank you. I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here today. Uh, thanks for having me. My name is Snehal Patel. I'm an assistant professor um, of internal medicine at Dell Medical School uh, at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, so I'm going to be speaking about uh, practical harm reduction strategies for people who use drugs and tips for everyday practitioners. Um, I have no relevant financial disclosures. Um, I am a board member of the Texas Harm Reduction Alliance and involved with several grassroots organizations that are advocating for social justice here locally, regionally, and um, across the country. So here are my learning objectives. Uh, first, to define harm reduction, its core principles, and its purpose in public health and in, in uh, justice movements. To describe some practical harm reduction strategies and services. To identify individual and institutional and structural barriers people who use drugs face in accessing care. And to apply harm reduction strategies my apologies, to address barriers to healthcare and to improve, improve health equity for people who use drugs. 
so what is harm reduction? And I, I use the uh, letters big H and big R and little H and little R. And so before I jump into this, I want to do a quick poll. Um, if uh, if y'all can help, perfect, yeah. How well do you understand the practice of harm reduction strategies on a scale of one to five? Wonderful. Okay, great. So we've got a lot of a lot of folks with a lot of expertise in the in the in the room. So um, I'm excited to see that. And and if anybody wants to jump in at any time, share um, you know uh, verbally or or through the chat, I inc highly encourage that. Let me see here. Right. So harm reduction is a set of practical strategies and ideas aimed at reducing negative consequences associated with drug use. Um, big H, big R harm reduction is also a movement for social justice built on a belief and a respect for uh, the rights of, and a respect for the rights of people who use drugs. So there's a lot of myths around harm reduction uh, that I wanna start us off with. Um, and I encourage folks, since we, we have a lot of experts in the room, I encourage folks to type in the chat some myths that they've heard or seen around harm reduction and maybe some of the correcting facts. So myth one, harm reduction is only for people who use drugs. Right? The intent with harm reduction is that to reduce risks and to reduce harm. Right? It could be anything from seat belts to you know, helmets, to face masks, condoms, designated drivers, all these things are you know, considered harm reduction. Myth two, harm reduction normalizes, encourages, and enables drug use. And so harm reduction accepts that people use drugs. Harm reduction is neither for nor against drug use. Harm reduction acknowledges the harms associated with risky drug use, and the focus is in supporting people's efforts to reduce the harms created by drug use or other risky behaviors. Right? Harm reduction programs do not increase substance use or the number of new users. Harm reduction programs increase exposure to treatment options, though. Myth three, harm reduction is opposed to abstinence and therefore conflicts with traditional substance use treatment. Harm reduction neither prevents nor uh, opposes abstinence. Right? Harm reduction uh, includes abstinence as one possible goal across a continuum of possibilities, if that's in the, in the individual's uh, goals. Uh, and and you know, this continuum includes, in, includes safer use as well. Now, harm reduction is not evidence-based, right? That is, a, that, is a, that is a big miss. There's, um, hundreds, if not thousands, of studies. Uh, many are at the end of the slide deck. Um, lots of research demonstrating the feasibility, effectiveness, cost effectiveness of harm reduction approaches. And this includes uh, you know, syringe exchange programs that are cost effective in reducing uh, HIV and HCV transmission, increase exchange users, access to other medical and social support services, safe injection facilities, including uh, you know, increase enrollment in detox treatment and do not increase social disorder in the communities that, they're, that they, that they um, operate in. Housing first programs, which is where services are provided without requiring abstinence from substance use, reduce costs of medical and social care, improve, improve clinical outcomes for individuals living with HIV AIDS. There's a lot, of, a lot of research to support harm reduction. So there's a lot of ways to define the core concepts around harm reduction. Uh, here's a few. So harm reduction offers a non-judgmental, non-coercive provision of services and resources for people who use drugs and the communities in which they live to assist and assist them in reducing harm. It establishes quality of individual and community life and well-being, not necessarily cessation of also substance use as the criteria for successful intervention and policies. Harm reduction at its core ensures that people who use drugs and those with a history of substance use have a real voice in creating programs and policies that are designed to serve them. This, I think, is really critical, right? Nothing about us without us. All policy should involve and be directed by those who are most directly impacted. Harm reduction deserves that social context and life circumstances affect people's vulnerability to and capacity for effectively addressing drug-related harm, right? And so this includes the effects of structural racism, gender, sexuality, discrimination, transphobia, ableism. These, these all affect one's vulnerability and ability to address drug harm. 
drug-related harm. So another core concept is that every person who uses substances uses them in a specific context, right? And that context has to be a part of the approach in, uh, in, in, in supporting them, right? Every person is an expert in their own experience of substance use. They're their own expert in navigating systems of care and what works for their survival. Drug-related harms most often emanate from the social structures, such as access to housing, food, economic insecurity, healthcare, rather than the drug itself. So let's talk a little bit about some practical strategies around harm reduction. So harm reduction services include an array of supports ranging from medication-assisted treatment, providing access to naloxone and uh, fentanyl test strips, providing access to sterile syringes, safe disposal, uh, supervised consumption services, support, uh, supportive housing, housing support, uh, pharmacy access, and referral and linkage to other supportive services. So I'm going to put a few links in the chat here uh, for resources that hopefully uh, you may find helpful for yourself and others. I, I want to go through these in, in, in uh, brief detail. Uh, so syringe access, right? It is possible to significantly reduce injection-related health risks if someone has a sterile syringe and proper equipment for every injection, right? Syringe service programs distribute sterile syringes, safer drug use supplies, and education to people who inject drugs. These harm reduction programs have proven to reduce uh, HIV and hep C infection rates by over 50%. Overdose production, uh, prevention is a very important harm reduction strategy. Right? Naloxone has been approved by the FDA for opioid, opioid overdoses since the 1970s, but it hasn't been until recently that communities around the country have started to embrace over, overdose education and naloxone distribution programs. Right? You can reverse an overdose if you know what to do and you act in time. Harm reduction is teaching people who use drugs and the people who love them how to mitigate the risk of an overdose and to stop an overdose while it's happening, right? It's about focusing attention and greater resources towards people who use drugs and their loved ones to provide them with the resources to save their lives. Prescribing naloxone to patients with high-risk drug use not only may save their life, but I would argue as a physician, it is an act of, of deep caring and trust building. Safer drug use. Safer drug use is about lessening the risk of adverse outcomes from using drugs, right? So there's a lot of reasons that, uh, that someone might use drugs, and there are other factors besides just drug use itself that can put people in harm's way. So this is why we provide resources to contextualize drug use, why people use drugs, and why to, why to, why to make it safer, depending on your situation, right? Um, some of these, some of these man, there's a, uh, manuals and zines in the chat that are really focused on how to use drugs safer, um, teaching someone injection use safety and basic wound care when they visit, visit with you in the clinic or hospital or, or social care you know, setting, really any setting, um, is again, an act of deep love, right? Teaching somebody how to, how to safely inject is, is, is an act of deep caring. Now, I want to talk very briefly about fentanyl. Uh, so, it, you know, I, I think everybody on here uh, probably knows a lot about fentanyl, but, you know, synthetic opioid at least 50 times uh, more potent than heroin, it's cheap uh, to manufacture, a small amount goes a long way. And you know, we know that opioid deaths or overdose deaths involving fentanyl have quadrupled in recent years. And because of the criminalization of people who use drugs, people, people are often unaware of the exact composition of the substances they're using, right? So this makes evidence-based harm reduction strategies such as fentanyl test strips, safety planning, access to safe supply, even more vital than ever, right? I'm going to put one more link in the in the chat, and this is um, a, a quick guide on fentanyl use and overdose pre prevention tips from the National Harm Redu Reduction Alliance or Coalition. Let me get to it. I apologize. Oh, that wasn't it. <laughs> that was a message to colleagues. Mm 
Okay, sorry about that. So, and then, you know, finally, medications for opioid use disorder. Um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to focus on this. I know that there have been a number of sessions that really focus on this, but we know that medications for opioid use disorder increase the likelihood that a person will, con con will continue to not use drugs. They reduce opioid use and symptoms related to opioid use disorder. They reduce the risk of infectious disease transmission. They reduce the chances of opioid-related related death. So I want to talk a little bit about barriers to care. So what are the barriers to accessing harm reduction services and care? Um, and we're going to look at this from you know, multiple levels, from the structural or societal level, which includes national, state, local policies and laws, institutional barriers, which includes organizational and clinic or health system policies, practices, and procedures. And there are individual barriers. And this refers to the knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors of individuals or groups of, groups of you know, care providers or practitioners. So before getting into the barriers specifically and some solutions, I want to state very clearly that Barriers to harm reduction and safe and effective public health and healthcare have significant consequences. And people who use drugs experience higher rates of comorbidity and premature mortality. They have significant unmet health needs. They're less likely to seek healthcare in primary care settings and use acute care settings instead, which means delays in care, higher treatment costs, and worse outcomes. People who use drugs have lower rates of treatment initiation for life-threatening infections and diseases. And that includes hepatitis C, HIV, mental health illness, cardiopulmonary diseases, and more. And there is a disproportionate burden of harm on many, right? Black and, Latin, Black and Latinx individuals have a disproportionate burden of health and social consequences like criminalization and death from substance use, despite having equivalent prevalence of substance use and substance use disorders. And black patients who use drugs are half as likely to obtain treatment following an overdose, an actual overdose, compared with non-Hispanic white patients, even when they're privately insured. Right? One social context, their race, class, gender identity, sexual orientation, et cetera, because of structural racism, sexism, heterosexism, classism, patriarchy, all alter the degree of consequences of these barriers for individuals. So what are some of the barriers at the individual level? And I'm going to go through these relatively quickly, but uh, I would love to, love to hear some conversation if this comes up. One, you know, negative beliefs about people who use drugs can translate into individual behaviors, interactions, and practices that limit people who use drugs' willingness to seek health care. And we see this every day. Providers' unwillingness to use particular services or medications for people who use drugs. Stigma and discrimination, and there's so much more that we could talk about around this, but you know, rates of stigma are extremely high, both in general public and you know, within professions that interact with people who use drugs, including health and social care professions. Research shows that stigma damages the health and well-being of people who use drugs and interferes with the quality of care they receive in clinical settings. Right? Sometimes we have competing priorities in clinical and health systems. Right? We're busy, we're overworked, we often focus on things that may not be the top priorities for our patients. And then often we just ignore or don't listen to people who use drug, drugs. What are some of the barriers at the institutional or organizational level? So organizational policies, as well as formal and informal practices make accessing care difficult. Cost of healthcare is high and there's a lack of affordability. Our workforce is not trained or experienced in drug use and supporting people who use drugs. There's a lack of providers, long wait times. And I'm gonna argue that mandated drug testing before initiating, initiating treatment is a huge barrier at an institutional organizational level. Sometimes it's due to institutional organizational policy, but it's not necessarily grounded in science and certainly not necessarily grounded in respect. The treatment setting may not be supportive of people who use drugs, including clinic, clinic hours, telehealth options, you know, what the space looks like, the location of the clinic, et cetera. And we have a lack of paid peer work, a lack of paid peer workers for support and navigation co-located within health and social care systems. And at a larger structural level, right, when we really think about policies and laws, what are some of the barriers? So some policies and laws influence the way we treat people who use drugs, right? Discouraging people who use drugs from seeking help and may even criminalize drug use. So for example, in Texas, 
people who call 911 to report an overdose are not protected by Texas's Good Samaritan law if they've been convicted of certain drug felonies or they've called 911 for an overdose within the past 18 months. Right? You're not protected by the Good Samaritan laws if you've used that service before or that law before in the last 18 months to uh, rescue somebody from an overdose. Structural racism, poverty, differential access to care significantly impedes meeting the social and economic needs of people who use drugs. So what are some ways to reduce barriers to, to reduce barriers to care and health and social care resources? So if the problem is that poor treatment contributes to significantly uh, contributes significantly to you know people using people who use drugs unwillingness to seek medical care, and to me the reason why it's an easily treated ail, uh, ailment can progress to something life threatening. The solution is to offer non judgmental, non coercive provision of services and resources for people who use drugs and the communities in which they live in reducing attendant harm. Right, the solution is harm reduction. There's a lot of strategies that we could think about at the provider level to reduce or remove barriers to care for people who use harm. I, I know this is kind of a busy slide, but I want to go through a few of these that that uh, that you know come to mind. And this list really is uh, comes out of collaborations with harm reductionists around the country and people who use drugs. So meeting people where they're at, right? That means giving options, giving choices, meeting them where they're at, being uncomfortable and taking risks. Don't act in a system that's designed to serve, I'm uh, sorry, in a system that's not designed to serve most people who use drugs, right? Be an activist, change the system. Use person-centered language, avoid stigmatizing language, focus on the person, not just their condition. Collaborate with patients in determining a care plan, and maybe even collaborate with patients in how you document in the chart, keeping an open record. Our system is not that designed in many ways to prioritize harm reduction. So we need to work around the system to meet our patients' patients' uh, you know, needs and, and you know, to build new systems. Educate yourself and say you don't know if, 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 you know if you don't know. Share information, not advice, advice, right? Share uh, safe injection practices, share wound care tips, share your medical knowledge. Ask for consent. Facilitate and celebrate self-directed small ch positive changes based on uh, based on your patients or based on the, uh, the, the, the client's goals. Value clients' unique experiences and needs. Utilize motivational inter interviewing and the trans-theoretical model of change, stages of change. Avoid being a rescuer or savior, right? This is not about saving others, but supporting both ourselves, our communities, and building with others in solidarity. Right? How do we think, change our framework to think about this from a harm reductionist? lens and really as part of a larger movement for social justice. Hold colleagues accountable for poor patient care. So this is hard in our communities, I think, especially in, in care communities, um, but we need to be holding ourselves accountable as practitioners and then maintain humor, right? Take care of, take care of yourselves, take care of ourselves. If we don't take care of ourselves. We can't do this work sustainably. And at the institutional or organizational level, say at the clinic, hospital, or health system, here's a few strategies for change. Right? So require mandatory harm reduction training for all staff, right? That's all providers, folks who work in, in, in administration, maintenance, the receptionists, the nurses, everybody should have mandatory harm reduction training. Cre create welcoming, I apologize, create welcoming spaces based on patient preference, not institutional convenience, right? Do clinic language audits, audits that are uh, you know, created by and evaluated by people who use drugs. What does the documentation language look like and how can that be changed in a clinic directed by people who use drugs to address stigmatizing language? Challenge institutional policies around drug screens, right? I think this is actually, a, this is a really big one. We know that there's a lot of, well, there's a lot of myths around the requirements of uh, urine drug screens, but we know that drug users Incre uh, sorry, drug screens increase stigma and keep people away from clinical settings, right? They are inherently inaccurate by their, by their, by their testing nature. They lack sensitivity and specificity and often cause and lead to decision-making confusion and uh, patient harm. I just had a patient earlier today where this was, this was specifically the case uh, from a drug screen in the emergency department. 
and in particular, it causes disproportionate harm to racial and ethnic minorities and increases distrust of providers and health systems, right? So we have individuals who get a drug screen that might come back with uh, cocaine positivity who comes in with chest pain who has true and STEMI, but doesn't get a cardiac catheterization. Challenge organizational protocols to notify adult and child protective services for substance use, right? Drug use does not equal neglect. Ensure structural racism and anti-oppression training for all, all staff. Hire peer support workers and community health workers in all clinical settings and pay them well. And address staff trauma and trauma transference, transference to patients. And then at a structural level, some strategies to address uh, uh, barriers include fundamentally it's about uh, you know, advocating for and challenging uh, policy and legal uh, systems to change to support and not harm people who use drugs, right? Advocate for expanded harm reduction services. Advocate for policies that impact people who use drugs positively. Taking the lead of people who use drugs, right? For example, housing for all or housing first policies, access to free transportation, food access, economic security, uh, economic stability through policy, decriminalization of drug use, challenging institutional and structural racism in policy and law. So that, that's a lot uh, to go through. I hope that the links that I shared um, will be helpful for you and those you work with. Um, as a br brief recap, so uh, in this talk, we sort of covered a few different things, harm reduction definitions and core principles, practical harm reduction, reduction strategies and services, individual, institutional, and structural barriers, people who use drugs face in accessing care and their consequences, and using harm reduction strategies to address barriers to care for people who use drugs. And here's references, um, and thank you, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Here's a few ways to contact me um, if you want to, and hope we stay in touch. Thank you so much, Dr. Patel. That was a wonderful presentation. I would like to open thank up you. the floor for some uh, questions and comments from our learning community here. Dr. Patel, that was uh, fantastic. That's really a great presentation. Do you know the update on fentanyl testing strips in Texas? There was a house bill in progress. Do you know what happened there? Um, my understanding, and correct me if, uh, if I'm wrong, I, um, I will crowdsource the answer to, but it was it was not passed. It was held up by a uh, legislature out of Houston. Um, and though um, the governor was um, had stated publicly um, early in the session that he was intent on uh, moving it forward, it was not moved forward. And so um, my understanding is that fentanyl test strips are not legal as such in Texas right now. But correct me if I'm wrong, somebody, if there's anybody on here. Yeah, I read the news reports, but I was not sure what happened for the. Th thank you for the update. Yeah. I will say it was a long fight, arduous fight. You know, I'm here in Austin, and the hospital is just a couple blocks from the Capitol. Um, folks organized from around the state to push for that and, and many other harm reduction strategies, um, including expansion of Medicaid um, and, and, and many other things. And um, you know, many things just did not pass, and there were some some har some things that were passed that I would argue um, increase harm to people who use drugs in this last le legislative session. I had a question or thought, um, Dr. Patel, in terms of like how you mentioned like stigma and things about how kind of holding colleagues accountable. I'm curious, this is a question for you and just kind of for everyone in general of what does that actually look like? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, how do you, um, and maybe people have examples or something like this, because I know that colleagues who are either in the medical field or whatever are not like malicious, but maybe have reason for why they have come to where they are at. And I'm not sure how to like interact in such a way that in a one interaction would really like change someone's mind, you know? Yeah, no, I appreciate that, Yosha. So I, and, and you know, we are always learning and changing, um, even if we don't necessarily always recognize it. Like, 
day to day, hour to hour, patient by patient or client by client, you know, interaction with uh, with your child one time to the next, right? We're always learning and changing. And, and I think, um, so part of that is that I'll give an example, uh, you know, just say um, the urine drug screens I've talked, I talked a little bit about, right? So um, there's a thought that, you know, everybody that is initiated on, say, you know, buprenorphine or, you know, there is a federal, federal mandate for, you know, patients initiated on methadone to get one urine drug screen on initiation. Um, but outside of that, there's not really a whole lot by way of federal mandating around urine drug screens, right? Um, and and so my thinking around this has changed drastically over the last few years as I've read more about it, understood more about it, looked at the literature in particular around the harm to Black and Latino uh, patients who get tested um, more frequently in emergency departments and are then immediately stigmatized or don't show up to the emergency department because they because they say the first thing they're going to do is check my pee, right? And so my my thought process around this has changed a lot, and some of that has just come from hearing it from, you know, hearing it from, from, from patients or clients or other harm reductionists, um, and, then, and then also challenging that, right? And so kind of bringing it to colleagues and saying, hey, listen, like, maybe, maybe, we, could, maybe we can approach this a different way, or, you know, I, I think taking that non-judgmental, non-coercive approach with, our, with ourselves, with our colleagues, I think is also a really, really important uh, way to be able to sort of dance in these kind of conversations. I would love to hear other thoughts about that because I think it's challenging to, especially within our um, care and clinical care and social care communities to challenge each other to what I'm going to say, do better, but, you know, it could be put in a lot of different ways. Side of comment, um, especially with our legal system in the state, do you Recently, I had to testify in a federal hearing, and the individual was 20 at the time of the hearing. It was a sentencing hearing, um, but 18 when it started, right? And they got caught with 25 fentanyl pills, which with our uh, people we serve, that is planning ahead. But in sentencing laws, that is <laughs> distribution, <laughs> intent, right? And then they didn't respond appropriately. They had a friend that overdosed with the fentanyl pill that um, was given to them from him. And they both were intoxicated on fentanyl at the time. And unfortunately, this, this kid is could have got life, but got 14 years, right? Um, is there advocacy groups with our sentencing law? Because as you see, obviously fentanyl is getting like a large media coverage, and I'm going to throw the book at you if you get caught with it. And a lot of times, you know, I mean, I one of my purpose was to establish there was an OUD diagnosis, but it really didn't go far when it came down to sentencing. So um, do you know of any legal advocacy groups for what we do to try to lobby with these laws and stuff like that, in particular in Texas, I guess? <clears throat> yeah, I'll, I'll start with the Texas Harm Reduction Alliance. Um, they're based here in Austin, um, but work with um, harm reduction around the country and people use, I'm sorry, oh, around the country, but you know, in particular around the state um, and people use drugs um, around the state. Um, and, and they do a lot of, and I'll, I'll drop their, um, the organizational link in the chat in a second, but uh, a lot of work around really trying to um, push forward some of the policy changes that are needed at the state level or at the local level to uh, decrease harm uh, for people who use drugs. You, you know, the, the uh, law that passed around charging someone who distributes and distributes could be, you know, I brought a little bit for me and I brought a little bit for my friend um, because I never use alone. Um, and that friend overdosed and uh, and and died, and I didn't call because, you know the 911 because of the you know Good Samaritan law, and I didn't want to go to jail. But that law that passed that now allows me to be charged for murder, murder um, of my friend is an example of an ongoing war. You know, this is the ongoing racially motivated drug on wars. Uh, I'm sorry, war on drugs. I apologize. Um, at another level here, right? The terminology that's used by legislatures and and you know others who are advocating for this is very racially and ethnically um, 
driven terminology in terms of you know who should be affected by this law and charged for murder um, for using a substance with another person. Right? They're not going for going after you know kingpin drug manufacturers, you know, or something like that. Right? Um, and then you know, I'll go back. It, speaking of you know laws and policies, right? The, so there was an attempt to revise the Good Samaritan law because of the you know um, obvious challenge to uh, the um, you know who doesn't qualify for it, and that was that was also a you know um, a lot of a lot of folks around the state advocating for revising that. It did not move forward either uh, this session. So I think you know a lot of this for folk, for people that are interested in at least policy change at the state level or national level or local levels, whether it's Dallas or Austin, wherever. Um, a key component, and this comes out of harm reduction social movement strategy building, right, as a movement for social justice, a key component is we need to organize to be able to build power to push for policy change. Without that, nothing changes, right? And organizing requires taking the leads of those who are most directly impacted, who are very clear oftentimes with these policies. And that's where the Texas Harm Reduction Alliance is. That's why I'm pointing them out, because the people that work there, the people that are on staff and the people that lead the movement there are all people who use drugs and are directly impacted by the drug war, by homelessness, by the uh, you know uh, 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 by by you know multiple multiple crises and you know various structural vulnerabilities, and they're leading the charge, saying, "Here are the important policy changes that could help," and we as professionals also should support that work, right, and use our professional. Um, uh, title and space and 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 you know um, privileges to advance advance that work, not take it over, not act as though we know what is best, but to support the work that is being pushed forward by people who use drugs and other harm reductionists. Thank you so much, Dr. Patel. And uh, this has been a wonderful discussion. And uh, on that note, we will move on to the next part of our session right now. Um, Cato, if you could please share the BVEL program thing. Thank you so much. Uh, the Center for Substance Use Training and Telementoring, CSTAT, provides high quality education to healthcare providers. CSTAT makes evidence-based practices available to addiction specialists in Texas and the US with sessions like the one you're attending today. For more information, please visit bevaltexas.org. Next slide. Um, a quick announcement, the FDA has approved Brixati extended release injection. Um, it's available in two formulations, weekly and monthly. For more information, please visit uh, this link and we can drop this link on the chat as well. Next slide. Uh, to claim CME credits, you have to text this number by midnight today. It's 1009-2969 at the number given here. So please remember to text before midnight today. Next slide. Uh, do join us for our next session. It will be on Tuesday, July 18th. We have an interesting speaker lined up. Thank you. And with that, we will move on to our case presentation. Uh, Dr. Waklu, um, if you could please uh, walk us through the case today. Certainly. This is a, 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 a 23-year-old gentleman. This is a case submitted in... Uh, one of our uh, previous learning sessions. And uh, this is uh, the primary reason for, for uh, the person being in jail was he was arrested and he was in opiate withdrawal. So this was a gentleman arrested in December. Uh, uh, the charge was burglary of habitat, position of a controlled substance. He resisted arrest and he also had a parole violation. So he was sent to the ED primarily because he allegedly swallowed a bag of methamphetamine in her and also had a hand injury on the police vehicle, um, did not lose consciousness. Um, his urine drug screen was uh, uh, free of illicit drugs when he um, reached the ED. Uh, a CT head was negative for any fractures or any orbital injuries. And... Uh, and there were no other findings on on the CD uh, on the CD head, and uh, and he did report to, to the intake nurse that he had a headache and some dizziness, and uh, he was uh, uh, tested negative for uh, COVID and monkeypox. These are his vitals on admissions. Uh, 
unremarkable. Uh, he was uh, uh, anxious, his cooperative, uh, uh, the, the ED staff were not sure of how, about the reliability of his, uh, his history. He was uh, ambulating, he was, uh, his gait was steady, his speech was clear, he had made good eye contact, he was alert oriented times four. So nothing uh, 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 major on his exam, except he had a right upper lip uh, with, uh, with a small hematoma, and, uh, and on the right, right side of his head, there's a uh, raised area, multiple abrasions, but nothing major. Uh, his cows uh, was uh, one, uh, it says due to being anxious, BMI 22, uh, and he appeared to be uh, kind of rapidly tapping his uh, feet. He was uh, unremarkable medical history. He was not on any medications, uh, uh, drinks two beers a day, did not specify what, uh, how many ounces the, bear were, the bears were, uses methamphetamine daily and uses a gram of heroin per week. His last use was prior to his arrest. He was completed high school, uh, lives in an apartment with his girlfriend, and is uh, currently unemployed. He has uh, one child, a daughter. Uh, history of uh, uh, d depression, uh, anxiety. Uh, it says informal PTSD. I'm not sure anyone had formally diagnosed him. Um, he made a suicide attempt in, in 2011 by cutting himself. Uh, details on the attempt are not known how serious the attempt was, uh, denies any suicide ideations. Uh, and currently when he uh, was in the ED, there were no safety concerns from, the, from that. And he had one psychiatric hospitalization in 2011. Not sure whether that was related to the, to the attempt. Uh, uh, so the on-call provider was contacted uh, uh, and uh, they put him on some neuro checks. They did... Uh, and uh, he was had an appointment with uh, the provider the next day. There was uh, uh, no, no, there's the opioid withdrawal protocol was not initiated because SSU talks was negative in the hospital and he was referred to mental health. So in the, in the jail provider was seen uh, at bedside, uh, his cause was 15. He had some orthostatic hypertension, some tachycardia. He was started on a buprenorphine uh, taper, uh, uh, eight milligrams uh, daily for about 48 hours, four milligrams daily uh, for another 48 hours, and two milligrams daily for, for another 48 hours. And uh, and first dose was given along with uh, oral hydration. He was followed up in 20 minutes. Symptoms significantly improved. His blood pressure improved. His tachycardia resolved. The patient was moved to the medical observation unit, and he was encouraged to continue hydration. And these are the cow scores uh, that, uh, that are mentioned there uh, uh, from the 15 hours initial score. And these are the scores that were done uh, for the next few days. And he was again seen at the completion of his taper, reported feeling great and eager to move out of the medical observation. And he was referred for follow up and follow up uh, doing well, still having some insomnia cravings, uh, wants to stay sober upon release and discussed. Uh, we've been offering more detail and community resources set up with a three-day release supply and information on local clinics where a patient can continue care upon release. Uh, and uh, and so uh, his PMP was checked, uh, no red flags on the PMP. And uh, so this is the what the jail uh, policy was at that time. Uh, they historically had done a, a, a opioid withdrawal protocol using the, the, the regimens of uh, Bentil or vaccine, and then and and this was the new uh, buprenorphine uh, taper protocol that that we talked about earlier, and uh, and they had about monitored over two hundred patients, and uh, and twenty patients needed buprenorphine uh, uh, taper, and there were no trips to the ER, and uh, so that's uh, and their concerns uh, uh, of this for this uh, for this uh, gentleman were that uh, the swallowing of the methamphetamine and the heroin bag, his head injury. And he was seen at bedside and not in not in clinic. So, uh, do we have any additional details? Yes, we should do. Uh, uh, this is his past uh, substance abuse history, and uh, uh, no other no no other illicit drug use here. And uh, I'm not involved in in AA in 12-step meetings uh, and, uh, and uh, 
that's it. Yeah. So, uh, so that's uh, basically uh, uh, the summary of the. He is here. Uh, a gentleman in jail put on a pro uh, uh, buprenorphine and uh, Tabor protocol, and then uh, you know, the plan was to uh, uh, was to give him a three day supply upon discharge. So I'm going to open this up again. Not my patient uh, was this is a case from one of the earlier series that we received which we thought would be a good uh, discussion case. And so I'm going to uh, open it up to questions, uh, thoughts, comments on, on this patient. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Vaklu. And I see a question here from Dr. Patel. Would you like to unmute yourself, Dr. Patel, and maybe you can ask the question? Sure, yeah. Th thanks, Dr. Vaklu, for uh, presenting this case. I, I guess uh, one question I had was, uh, what the patient's goals were. And, and I know you mentioned um, when they followed up with you um, or followed up with the provider, their goal was to, um, was it sounds like uh, maintain sobriety is, is, is what was written. Um, but I guess uh, in terms of goal of treatment for um, acute withdrawal, um, I was trying to understand uh, why do the rapid taper as opposed to starting uh, maintenance buprenorphine? Yeah, that, that's what the first thing came to mind is why a rapid taper. I mean, first of all, I mean, why even do? I mean, it's, again, you know, it's a, uh, it's been we have said it so many times during all these uh, echo calls that uh, maintenance uh, is the way to go. So again, this is just relates to the again, uh, very relevant to the talk that you gave is the, again the stigma, the stigma of being on buprenorphine maintenance, the the anti buprenorphine and the anti methadone stance that we see in our legal system throughout the country, not just in Texas, and even though we have such a a huge uh, incarcerated population that has opioid use disorder. The risk of, as you know, the risk of overdose is so high upon release from jail and prison. We all know that <laughs> the numbers are there, yet we continue to 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 kind of uh, uh, to uh, follow this philosophy. I mean, giving someone a three day supply upon leaving, come on, trying to find a, an appointment in three days. Oh, well, uh, good luck with that. And uh, so, uh, so those are the, uh, and Dr. Kowalczyk and I had, we had a discussion about this that the, the, uh, the and I think in Tarrant County, there was a time that uh, Tarrant County jails were doing, they were big on giving people Bivitrol. I mean, the, the evidence is there, but clinically, you, I mean, uh, you, you know, it doesn't work. Vivitrol does not work for patients with opioid use disorder, with chronic opioid. It does not work. Uh, if people stop taking Vivitrol, their tolerance goes down, they relapse uh, to opioids, and they overdose. Uh, when people are on buprenorphine or methadone, they have a reason to come back and see you. On Vivitrol, they don't have a reason to come back and see you. So I've stopped using Vivitrol for opioid use disorders, even though there's evidence which uh, yeah, there are some large studies, but I'm I'm not a in clinical day-to-day -day experience. It's not something that works. So again, uh, just to, uh, to, uh, to, like I said, very relevant to the talk that you gave, and today is again the stigma and the and the anti-maintenance stance that the legal system has taken for decades. I mean, uh, you know, and uh, uh, thankfully there's being. They're still so open to some buprenorphine, but totally opposed to the idea of methadone, which is so unfortunate because the data on methadone is good, that data on bup is good, but uh, trying to convince uh, uh, judges and lawyers and probation officers, parole officers, it's just a, it's a Herculean task. Yeah. Uh, and I, so I think the access to Nalox to try to get someone into a bup or methadone program upon release three days is very, uh, unrealistic, optimistic, but to try to get someone on naltrexone, their follow-up after a month is like near impossible, at least in our area. I mean, right. that access is so much lower and it's such a more, much more expensive and hard to access medication. Um, so I would agree uh, for a lot of reasons. The other thing that was interesting to me is there was um, the case discussion and one of the questions was about, you know, the three-day supply, but there's also no mention of sending the person out with OEND uh, on their release date, which certainly would be necessary. And then there was another question, I think, within the um, within the presentation. I don't know if it, it came through on on this presentation about you know this person may may have um, ingested heroin on board 
uh, in terms of if a bag ruptures or something. So what is the risk of have, adding buprenorphine right away and starting a buprenorphine either induction um, or unfortunately as, as, as their protocol um, dictates a, a, a detox or a medicated withdrawal. And, you know, I like to think about that risk or scenario, you know, if a bag does rupture, having buprenorphine on board is kind of like someone coming in with um, a blood sugar issue and you don't know right away if it's too high or too low. Um, they have diabetes. And so um, we're always taught in medicine to go ahead and give sugar if you don't know and you can't get a quick check um, because if they have too low blood sugar, it'll help. Uh, if their blood sugar is too high, it's like another drop in the bucket, what sugar that you're giving them for the intervention. And so, um, you know, I think that question is a bit moot that um, there wouldn't be an, a reason to delay um, starting that um, from the jump. Thank you so much, Dr. Kowalczyk. And I do see some questions here coming up on the chat. Um, I don't know if we have an answer for this, but I'm gonna ask anyways from Jordan, was there an intake appointment scheduled with the prescriber before he was released? Um, I wasn't sure if that was mentioned on the case form. Um, and any type of mandatory therapy treatment upon release. Again, um, I don't think we have that information, but um, yeah. Any other questions from the from our learning community on how, uh, especially how would they have handled this case, or if there would be anything different that you would perhaps do for this patient? Or have you had any experiences with a patient similar who swallowed? Um, a bag of math. Oh, I can make a couple of comments. I know I've talked a lot, so I apologize. It's okay. Okay. No hands raised. Um, and, and this isn't specifically about this patient, um, and we could we could go directly back to that. But uh, this is more uh, regarding the question around mandatory um, mandatory therapy. Um, so it, you know, the rise of drug courts in in a number of cities and jurisdictions um, over the last you know decade um, or, or or more, uh, I think is something that we we've, we've seen with the idea that you know uh, these drug courts can provide a, an array of you know substance use treatments and community based treatments for people who use drugs um, who have who are being criminalized but I think stepping back from that it's really the structural you know isms right structural racism and policing leading to higher rates of criminalization for drug use in you know black indigenous and people of color communities and as a harm reductionist we would should advocate for full dec decriminalization of drug use as a means of challenging that structural racism within our legal systems, right? Drug courts, I think, have arisen in this like uh, you know small space in between, but the data on drug courts is not good. It, you know, they increase recidivism rates, they increase you know uh, subsequent arrest rates, um, and the when if a person is arrested after having gone to drug court and then mandated treatment program then the risk of um, if they get arrested a second time, their sentence will be longer than it would have been if they had gotten arrested two times otherwise. Um, you know, they are, uh, you know, I think, I think not um, necessary, they're, they're not harm reduction. Um, and, you know, I think there, there's, I know Physi Physicians for Human Rights has written about this um, quite a bit. Um, they had put out a report, a report a few years, a few years uh, ago about it. Um, I, I, I think re thinking about how do we use criminal criminalization strategies or policing strategies or legal challenges that strategies that are actually harmful to people who use drugs is not the right approach to thinking about uh, treatment, right? And then mandating treatment is not actually is non is not non coercive or non judgmental.
Dr. Patel, you do you make an excellent point on, on the data on drug courts. Uh, uh, but just, uh, I mean, uh, not that uh, uh, in the world of addiction treatment, coercion does sometimes work. I mean, I'm not saying it's that's what we should do, or, but it does. Uh, it does work. It's not absolutely, uh, I mean, especially if, when you're treating physicians with substance use disorders, if, if it's not for coercion, physicians would not get the help they need. I mean, I, that's the, the data is pretty clear on that. So I'm not advocating for coercion, but I'm just saying that as a in a clinical setting, coercion does sometimes work. People, even people who do not enter treatment willingly outside of the legal justice system, and just, just in a general sense, it does sometimes work, yeah. yeah. And I totally agree with you. Yeah. The, the criminalization of drug use, I think we have to get rid of that. So we wouldn't have the need for such a large, uh, large drug court system and have the need for such a large population that's incarcerated in jails and prisons for such related uh, criminal activities. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, sure. and, and I don't mean to say that I, you know, coercion, I, I work in the hospital and, and, you know, sometimes somebody doesn't want to be in the hospital, but from a medical standpoint, I really, really strongly feel they need to stay in the hospital. And so I use coercive techniques to help, um, help, you know, bring them onto, onto the side. I, I, I fully agree with that. And I would reframe it as, you know, how do we use like motivational interviewing techniques or, you know, to, and, and really engage in trauma and, you know, trauma informed care in that what could be called coercive sort of, you know, discussion and that sort of thing, right? But, but yeah, I hear you, I absolutely agree. Sorry, I jumped. Dr. Kualchit, you had something to... You're muted. Sorry about that. Yeah, I, I'm, um, you know, curious to um, hear how, you know, of the different folks that are attending today, how many are working, uh, within organizations that engage actively the criminal justice system. So I know like um, at my work at Santa Maria Hospital, we have jail and reach programs. We work with drug courts um, and things like that. And um, that's a way of at least um, having a, uh, an in somewhere to be able to, um, you know, uh, get in front of folks in the carceral system and uh, advocate for change. I'm just curious because I'm sure there's a lot of experience in our in our group here today with that. Hi, everyone. I'm Sharice from Harris Health. Um, I don't have any experience in correctional health just yet, but next month we are meeting with the Harris County um, corrections and we're trying to collaborate to um, establish a you know warm handoff for those inmates that are testing positive for opiates in while they're incarcerated there. Um, so hopefully in a couple of months I can come back and bring some of that information to you. One thing we are doing in our OBAT program here at Harris Health, we have a week that we go into the drug courts and we explain to them what um, services are out there about um, medication assisted treatment, about substance use disorders. Uh, we talk about wellness and prevention. Um, we talk about chronic disease management. And so we just give them an, an extra resource that if they um, need some assistance that we're there for them. Thank you so much. Uh, we're almost running close to time. Um, Dr. Kowalczyk, if you could please uh, help summarize this session for today. Yeah, um, so uh, the case was a case of uh, someone in, involved in the carceral system um, who was arrested uh, uh, for theft and, and drug charges and uh, had a um, complicated withdrawal um, where uh, medication wasn't initiated and continued for them uh, and just really highlighted some of the challenges uh, around um, lack of uh, the harm reduction uh, philosophy uh, in the carceral state currently. 
Thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us today. This has been an amazing session. Thank you for sharing your insights and experiences. And uh, thank you, Dr. Patel, for an informative uh, didactic earlier this afternoon. And uh, please do join us. Our next session is on Tuesday, July 18th. And uh, don't rem uh, forget to claim your CME credits by texting the number that Cato has very kindly shared in the chat. Uh, please make sure to text it by midnight today. Thank you all and have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you.